So welcome to this second day of the symposium to another Future Forward talk. My name is Sarah Berg and once again we are closing the conference with two guests, one forward thinking professional and a student responder to collect their viewpoints and critical notes to the topic of the day. Um, today we've heard a lot about power, power sharing, and the museum as a powerhouse. My big thank you goes to our speakers for your powerful thoughts and ideas to be brought in. It is now my pleasure to continue this heartbeat with Dr. Yvette Mutumba and Yara Haridi. Welcome to the two of you. Um, Yara Haridi is a PhD student studying the evolution of bone cells at the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Her research looks at how bone cells might tell us more about extinct animal metabolism, genome and physiolo physiology. She blogs about her research. You can find her at thebarebones.org and she is working as a science communicator. Yvette Mutumba, editor-in-chief, as you already heard, um, of Contemporary End and Contemporary and America Latina. She worked as a curator at the Weltkulturenmuseum Frankfurt am Main in Germany and later as part of the curatorial team of the 10th Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art in 2018. Yvette is also curator at large at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam and currently lectures at the Institute of Art in Context, University of Arts in Berlin. So welcome. Thank you for being with us. So for this short talk, we would have a long list of power relevant questions to be discussed. But uh, maybe let me start with your uh, definition. And I guess these are critical minded definitions as well of power in the arts and power and in our in our art institutions and maybe you also put in concern that our lives in the programming in the employees for in all those people involved in the working processes and of course in the audience so maybe Yvette would you like to start with your definition or your yes. thoughts um, thank you Sarah for the introduction and thank you to the organizers of the symposium for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Um, it was really interesting to listen to the discussions and questions um, before throughout the afternoon. So yes, I mean, for me, this question of power, it maybe starts in a way with what has been said before a lot, that um, power needs to be shared in institutions. And I think it is really, we have to be careful about this, how this doesn't become somehow this um, notion or a buzzword that is being used and that is not really filled. I think there lies a power in the ability of sharing power. And I think this is something that needs to be said also, that it is not only giving away something, but it's also a powerful thing to do, to, to share power, to, to acknowledge that sometimes um, it's time to make space. Um, another aspect is that um, it came up a lot, this question of power in terms of the relation to money and how funders and foundations um, and government funding can put pressure on institutions and organizations by deciding on whether they get money or by taking away money. So, I mean, I agree there is there's a power to that, but what I felt hasn't really come up yet. I mean, I did miss a little bit of some of the other deep dives because of our technical <laughs> testing session. Um, but what I feel is really important to also not forget that power, that grassroots power that comes from, let's say, the other side. So you have this power here, you know, government funding and so on. But you also have the, the power that comes from here. And when I say from here, I mean, it is the power of the audience, it's the power of society, it's the power of cultural producers, it's the power um, of young, a young generation that does want to see other institutions. And I mean, I talk a lot with especially younger artists of color, <clears throat> um, which question themselves what they can actually do in this moment right now, which goes beyond 
discussions and um, sorry, you know, symposia and things like that. And I, I always keep saying, you know, don't forget that you also have power. You have power by the way of saying if someone invites you uh, and you feel like that this institution is really more looking into tokenistic ideas of how they want to um, change their structures, then say no. I mean, of course, it's very a luxurious thing to do that. But and if you can't afford to say no, because we all know you need the gig, you know, you need the fee for the performance, for the participation on the panel or whatsoever, then come with demands and requests and say, OK, yeah, thanks for the invitation. But if I really am supposed to participate, then please make sure that, I don't know, you do some workshops about diversity and discrimination in your staff or, you know, just an example to just, you know, make it make that demand because it's often this idea of especially from cultural producer side, especially from young cultural producers that it is this big thing that you can enter an institution. So the museum invites you because that's the powerful institution. So you make it if you make it into the institution. But especially in this moment right now, it's a lot about also, well, but they need you too, because they are, they are at this point where this pressure is really high. So they really depend also on that input and on those, you know, strategies that come from cultural producers from outside the institution. And so I think that shouldn't be underestimated. And I think it's really time also to reevaluate re these kind of hierarchies um, between who's like entering the institution, not only as in terms of the audience, which is something we can maybe talk about us in a minute, um, but also who are the producers that are being shown or presenting inside the institutions. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, but do you agree or do you see it uh, slightly from another angle because of your discipline as a researcher? Uh, right. So, yeah, uh, from acad the academic side, um, I, I agree with most of that. I would just add that there is the additional power of allowing someone's career to go forward. There is all these gatekeeping um, people. And when those people are not of diverse backgrounds or diverse life experiences, um, that power ends up being incredibly skewed. And that actually, to me, brings in the true definition of power, which is, in essence, the idea of shaping the future. That's when you have true power. You have the influence to shape who gets seen, who gets heard, where the money goes, who gets the positions to shape our future. And museums are in a very critical part of that because, um, as one of our amazing speakers said today, we ha museums are these seed banks. So we get to take care of the future, but we also get to highlight that. And that's a power that needs to be shared and needs to be kind of moved around. And let's see what works, because what works for you might not work for the society you live in. And that kind of thing is continuously changing. So I think that's what power is. Yeah. And then maybe can I add something also? Yeah. Um, also, this question of because it ties in with what you just said, this in which I hadn't mentioned also this question of empowerment so which is a word that also has been used um today and i think this is a it i think really it's a word that shouldn't be used lightly and i think um in the question of the definition of power it's often also a definition how you use certain terms and who can empower whom and i think this uh, is not necessarily that always you know, the institution, for example, can decide whether they actually have the right to empower or whether it is wanted that they empower. So I think this is also a matter of dialogue. Um, and uh, I mean, if you think of grassroots, grassroots communities or projects, I mean, they empower, but this is because they grow. They grow over time. They have this dialogue. They have exchange. They build a community. And through that, they start to empower. But if an institution that is already there as this big machine uh, decides, oh, now, now is the time to empower, I think it is in a way tricky because um, then again, it's actually very, uh, 
how you say that paternalistic maybe I don't know what the right word is but in English but just to say because they decide now that they empower but this is something that has that has to grow in a community I think and this is something institution has to be very careful and aware about um, how how they start if they want to share power with I think of course it's a good thing if they start thinking about this Thank you very much, because empowerment, what we hear almost every day nowadays, um, uh, is, like you say, a tricky thing. And um, um, yeah, I mean, if there is the idea of uh, the museum as a powerhouse, uh, or it sees itself as a public space. Um, I mean, did we not call it community centers in the past? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not quite sure. And um, like you already uh, re said, um, Yvette, this comes from uh, grassroots and bottom up, huh? um, and not so much from corporate down. I don't know. Um, but maybe. What does, to get a little deeper in that, um, what does it tell about power and power sharing? If the idea of uh, um, dealing with uh, empowerment is getting corporate. I think what, what um, Yvette was trying to point to as well and it is basically worrying that it's it's going to get co-opted by these institutions that have ignored this problem for so long, right? Um, but at the same time, by not actively trying to empower people, they are empowering other people, um, whether it's people who are from the past, whether it's people that, you know, we shouldn't be agreeing with anymore. It's by not giving that platform to some people, you're automatically kind of giving it to others. And, and, and like you said, we have to be very specific about how we use that word empowerment and who is allowed to really be given power and by whom. And I think that's, that's a really important question. Yeah, I think so too. And I mean, you talk about this corporate idea uh, of, of power. I think there it also, is if we talk about institutions, we also, of course, need to talk about funding institutions, how they use that power. Um, I mean, Nico mentioned that earlier today, you know, that there are a lot of funding institutions saying, okay, you know, show us your program, show us your boards, show us, you know, what you're doing, and then we tell you whether you get the money. But of course, this needs to be also introspectively reflected within those funding institutions, what that means, because suddenly it's this weird shift of power, you know, that pops over there and what does that what does that actually mean apart from those questions of course how sustainable that is if these sort of programs stop maybe after 10 years and how far then institutions are still feeling obliged to continue in the same spirit or, or attitude mm. so maybe we could end and say what is the challenge but also chance and maybe also the overwhelming when future museums want to be rather uh, would be like to be everything or serve like everything. So maybe uh, is there uh, from your side like um, what in in your opinion is the minimum idea of a museum? Could you answer that? The minimum ideal or idea? Idea from your idea. from your thinking. Mm -hmm. I would say that the minimum that a museum does is serve its community, whether it's an art museum, whether it's a natural history museum. The point is to broaden the community's exposure to whatever your museum is about. It's for the community, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. And I think in that sense, also understanding who your community is um is really important part of that because i think this also really quickly happens when we talk about how we use certain notions um that it is a lot of talked about diversity and so on and especially also in the german context i'm not always really sure whether those people who talk about it are really aware how diverse the society around them is or who the audience actually could be so yeah i totally agree it, it really starts from there and then i thought and also in addition to that, I think it's also maybe to um, somehow acknowledge that 
a museum is not necessarily anymore, let's say, um, a space that only is this institution of knowledge um, or that, that gives you knowledge, but that also understands that they have to be open for questions or being questions or maybe also posing questions in, in terms of what they show. Uh, and so it's not always the ultimate truth that's being produced through that institution. And I think that is kind of a minimum also, because I mean, I at least also still grew up in a way that you go into a museum and you read the wall text and you think that is the ultimate truth that's being told. And we do know, I don't know, but I do know by now <laughs> that that's not necessarily the case. And so I think this is also kind of a bottom line um, from institutional side to to sort of open that up and to really also mediate that toward the audience that they say, look, we have this kind of knowledge, but you have that kind of knowledge. And so now come, let's come together, you know, and see what that can actually create in, in that space provided by the institution. Mm -hmm. um I very much liked what Elvira uh, elaborated about understanding and communicating the whole processing of things and handcrafting objects. I think it is really wonderful including this aspect um, so that uh, museum visitors remember Eva yesterday called them the uh, the, the museum users <laughs> uh, understand so that people understand uh, to learn about the how she put it the, so the social life or the Kraftfeld you would say in German uh, the Kraftfeld and the social life of things that have been made to become objects in the past as we know um, so um, Yara as a researcher you should be close to that concept of really getting into the circle of creating and understanding things from, let's say, the cell, is it? And um, how much would you like to present, uh, like, let's say, open labs in museums to also show the public how research and your work uh, to study the structure of organism and fabrication look like? Would you be fond of uh, an idea of, like this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a big proponent of um, open labs or open preparation labs. So if, you know, people are working on dinosaurs or whatever, and the way that they're prepared, people are almost always just as interested on how this animal came from the ground to be mounted into a museum, what process that was, how many humans were involved, what families were involved, what cultures were involved, what, you know, who's who discovered it first oh it was a little kid and his dog and then they talked to this person and like the human aspect of it really gets people closer to the science and i think that's a great basically delivery system for people to understand that you know we don't just walk into museums and these skeletons are there or these specimens are there there's a big human aspect to it which of course is how a lot of bias comes in but you teach people about that and and that's some of my favorite stuff, having open labs, having open collections, which is something that um, the Museum for Naturkunde is working on, having their collections accessible to the public. So they're no longer these dusty old rooms that are hidden away from everybody, but people can actually walk through them and understand the thought process and the wonder that like a scientist gets, you know, because scientists are just people that got curious and the average person is just as curious. Um, so when we open that up to people, I think, that's when we can actually have good conversations. Mm. But how about the social life behind or of uh, pieces of handcraft or art? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that this is really important to, to, open, to open up and make it accessible to get this idea also, it ties in with a little bit with what I said before, that this idea of what an institution or museum is and and what, what kind of knowledge they provide. And that I think if you open it up and you have this opportunity to see the social life of, of these things uh, that became then at certain point museum objects, but of course there was something else before. Um, and also in what you said in that process, the people are being evolved. So that means also there are all these very subjective perspectives on the object that have been left uh, in traces through the database, through the keywords that you find in the database. You know, I mean, it's very different in a way how people in the 1930s would describe an object from 
you know, the Luba, I don't know, you know, in an ethnographic museum, obviously, and how they would talk about the ethnic groups that would use it then you know, today. And I think this is, of course, a huge, crazy, big work that <laughs> would need to be done to actually go through this. But I think uh, at least to start with this idea that this is, of course, not like an objective um, static thing, you know, this kind of way of categorizing objects and how they're being presented. I think it's it's super important to to get to this next step. How how museums can really engage with their communities. Mm. Mm. Um, just before when we met, um, uh, we talked a little bit about what uh, Roxana mentioned in her concept of a new museum that she is calling a receptive, uh, receptive and intuitive museum, um, bringing in intuition. Is this um, something that fascinates you, something that uh, you would like to involve in your, in your daily work and how? Intuition, uh, is there a chance to put it in methods? And practice. I mean, I I really very much believe in intuition. Uh, intuition also in a sense of being emotional about things, uh, because I don't think being emotional has to be necessarily something negative or something uh, unscientific or unexpert like things. So I I really believe, uh, and I really I also use that in my practice daily practice, I mean, in the way how, how we um, run the end, but also in my curatorial work, it's a huge, it has a huge place uh, as a mythology to think around um, intuition in regards to how you interact not only with the people or the network you work with, but also, of course, um, if it comes to artwork or choosing artwork and all these kind of things to be less strategic about it by not saying, okay, this is an artist who has shown already four times in this institution, so maybe we should not show him because, and so on, you know, that often comes in, especially in curatorial practices where you feel like you have to implement these kind of fact sheets, you know, and now I think a lot of curators are really affected by this, by this pressure of having to be diverse and global and so on that you have to, your checklist and make sure, okay, do I have like my five artists from Africa? Do I have my three artists from, you know, I'm a bit exaggerating, but you see what I mean? And so for me, that's the opposite of being more intuitive about that and being speaking intuitively also, you know, have this relationship with, with artwork uh, and, and, and cultural production. So I think this is a very valid method. And I really love that idea of an institution that is intuitive and perceptive. But I, I just think it is also a very personal and in, very individual strategy. And then a museum is just this big machine, as we all know. And there are so many different individuals that come into play. So um, I think it, I, I can't, right now, I don't really know how as a whole an institution can be intuitive with coming in, you know, with all these subjective ideas. But I do think it is possible maybe, you know, with growing together and after a certain while, it might be possible that there are these um, moments or organizations that can actually uh, act in that way. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, with most of that. Yeah, intuition is is yeah something that we should basically be open to using, and it shouldn't be this kind of hidden thing. We don't have to boil down all our decisions into numbers and checklists. Sometimes we know that this is the right direction because we know, like we've we've taken all of our life experiences, and we know why this should be the direction the museum is going or this program is going. And in that way, I really think intuition can come into play in small parts of decision making, which then lead to, you know, power, basically. Uh, but of course, again, um, just to echo what she said, um, yeah, it's hard to think of how that would work on an institutional level because of how many people are involved in a decision and how many nuts and bolts uh, have to turn for anything to actually happen at a museum. So I'm very intrigued on how that's actually going to come into play. Okay, beautiful. Um, so 
big thank you to the two of you. Uh, I don't know, is it a big step to tomorrow's topic of uh, museum and entertainment? <laughs> uh, what would you say? Um, when are you having fun in museums? Do you remember the last time? Uh, I actually, I, I think the best way to educate or teach or basically share a museum experiences is by making it enjoyable. There's no way you're going to get through to anybody without making it fun. You know, for me, it's entertain first and then educate second. And it has to be this, this fun experience because that's how what people remember. People associate fun and lightheartedness with a good experience. And we have to marry the two uh, to a great extent for the overall experience to actually be repeatable and to bring people into museums. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I, I, I had a lot of fun in museums. Uh, and I think, you know, and me now, especially also thinking from the visual arts side, if there are these artworks that also really touch you or hit you in one way or the other, this is like amazing and, and great if that if that happens. And often that is actually also through the more entertaining level, if we say entertaining can also be something that's probably maybe just beautiful or aesthetically very engaging or, you know, and I think also it doesn't exclude itself, you know, there can be exhibitions and artworks that are aesthetically like very, um, you know, embracing and speak to you. And at the same time, they also talk about very complex topics or bring up things that the artists want to bring across. So I also think this idea of that it always has to be either discursive or entertaining um, doesn't have to be that way. I think there are really a lot of um, options to, to actually bring that, to bring that together. Thank you. So more of that tomorrow. You better stay tuned. Uh, thank you for sharing your beautiful thoughts and all the best, all the best, uh, Yara, all the best, Yvette. And thank you, thank you for joining. Enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.